Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Toshiko Mori, Professor in the Practice of Architecture here at the GSD. I am the host of this amazing event tonight. I'm seated in front of a white room with a beige curtain to my right. I'm wearing a peach colored shirt and I have a short black hair. First, a quick reminder about some features you'll see in this webinar. Our speakers will respond to questions from the audience during the event. Feel free to submit questions into the queue at any time by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We also have live captioning available for this event. Click the closed caption button at the bottom of your window to turn them on. Before we begin, I want to invite you to join us for the upcoming GSD public programs. Tomorrow at noon, architectural historian Rebecca Choi will give a lecture exploring the history of air rights through the lens of a specific case from the 1960s involving a developer, the residents of Harlem, and the Museum of Modern Art. On Monday, April 12th at noon, join us for a public lecture by architecture studio, H. Architectes, who will discuss how their practice makes natural phenomena evident and allows the invisible to appear. Sounds like amazing lecture. All lectures will happen on Zoom and requires registration. More information about these events as well as how to register is available on GSD's website. Before we begin, I must acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the ancestral territories of Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag nations. I would also like to acknowledge that I am calling in from the occupied land of the Lenape Nation. I am an uninvited guest on this land and want to recognize those who have stewarded it, past and present. We are all calling in from different lands and I would encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge whose land you are on before our program starts. You can use the links provided in the chat to learn more about land acknowledgement and to learn whose land you occupy if you do not already know. And now for today's program. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's virtual public lecture, Black Radical Space, the Black School in Brian C. Lee Jr. in conversation. The conversation is with Joseph Cuyer and Shani Peters, founders of the Black School, and Q&A following the conversation is moderated by Tara Oluwatemi, GSD NOMAS co-events chair and African-American Student Union Media Chair. Brian C. Lee Jr. is a design principal of nonprofit, a multidisciplinary architecture and design practice collocate based in New Orleans. He is a national design justice advocate, the recipient of Emerging Voices Award from Architectural League in 2019, and is a founding organizer of the Design Justice Platform and organizer of the Design as Protest National Day of Action. He advocates pursuit for racial, social, and cultural justice through the process and outcome of design Collocate is a combination of words, colloquial, locate, and collocate to empower marginalized communities to reflect on unjust, destructive, and buried history and stories that can come alive with textures, colors, images, and senses, and diverse memories and associations long suppressed, silenced, and denied access and expression by white dominant power structure and systemic racism. Brian says, quote, architecture is complicit in system of racism by creating physical environments 
that have historically disenfranchised black and brown communities and blocked people for accessing power and reinforced segregation, end of quote. In order to dismantle systemic racism, Collocate works to change the pattern to redistribute power and fundamentally change inequitable systems that perpetuate injustice and causes continuous damage to lives. Collocate intrinsically connects practice and pedagogy because wealth, wellness and health, and education necessary for collective prosperity it needs the frame of time to build continuity, consistency, and vigilance to achieve longer term goals. The Black School was founded by Joseph Kuye III and Shani Peters in 2016. They are socially engaged artists, designers, and educators with relevant experience working at the intersection of K-12, university, teaching, art, design, and activism. They have founded Black School to confront inequity in white supremacy and systemic racism in the art world and society at large. It was in 1987, Havardina Pindel delivered Art World and Racism Report at Hunter College in New York City, demonstrating art world is complicit in systemic racism and exclusion of artists of color. Shani and Joseph are artists in residence at New Museum in 2018 and spoke about bringing radical black aesthetic and how to make black artists radical agents of change. Three years later, now at the New Museum is a mounting uh, current show, Glorious, haunting, inspirational, and powerful exhibition, Brief and Grievance, Art and Morning in America. Their three-part ecosystem for this task involves Itinerant Art School, a design firm that offers paid internship to young people of color, an annual art and music festival called Black Love Fest. They aim to dismantle division between art and knowledge production and civic engagement to lead a revolution of ideas through relationships instead of through objects that operate in capitalist economy. For them, the black school is the art form. As winners of 2021 Creative Capital Rubbers, they continue therefore to engage arts, economics, education, justice through self-determination and collective action. We can observe that integration of art, architecture, design, knowledge distribution, pedagogy, and civic action in all of their work are there to increase capacity to build alliances and to empower by amplifying visions, actions, voices of marginalized communities. Please welcome Brian, Shani, Joseph, and Tara. And uh, Brian will start this uh, session. Uh, thank you, Toshika. Uh, um, thank you, Joseph, uh, to my uh, dear friends at the GSD. Uh, this is gonna be a fantastic conversation. I'm glad that we're here together. Uh, so please uh, sit back and enjoy. So we're going to start just by giving some ground setting, uh, some general understanding of what it means to consider uh, Black radical space uh, through the lens and perspective of uh, an educational framework uh, called the Black School itself. I start uh, talking about freedom. Now, there's a, a reason that we, we, we spelled it uh, just a bit off. Um, in 1831, uh, at Turner, uh, the slave rebellion that he led uh, murdered 55 people. Um, in response to this, uh, militias were formed. Um, the ad additional nearly 200 people were, uh, enslaved people were uh, gathered up and murdered themselves. Now, 
One was a social response, the kind of socialization of, of, of militias as a ardent part of American society post, uh, post this event, and it happened nationally. Um, one of the other things that uh, was clear and what sparked uh, what we would call a revolution is laws in Virginia that started to actually determine anti-literacy uh, in this place. So I'm just gonna read a quick passage. Uh, Every assemblage of Negroes for the purpose of uh, instruction in writing or in reading or writing or in the nighttime for any purpose shall be an unlawful assembly. Any justice uh, may issue his warrant to any officer or any other person requiring him to enter any place where such assemblage may be and sees any Negro therein. And he or any other justice may order such Negro to be punished with stripes. If any white person uh, with a Negro, he shall be confined to jail for no more than six months uh, and have a fine that exceeds no more than $100. Um, this is the framework which girded so much of the uh, educational revolutions to follow. There's a long history of freedom schools uh, and black schools that uh, started from an anti-literacy movement uh, or that is in response to an anti-literacy movement that became about a common schools movement. Uh, the American uh, Missionary Association uh, was a part of that, uh, that effort. You see here in the center of your page is uh, Mrs. Mary Peake, who was one of the first teachers of the American Missionary uh, Association uh, and sat outside of a large oak tree in Virginia uh, her home and taught young people. That oak tree, that space uh, eventually became the uh, seating ground for Hampton University. But this was in context of a larger set of schools. So both Missionary and the Freedmen's Bureau worked uh, during the Civil War and after to uh, put thousands of schools up into the world. So from 1961 to 1965, you saw this effort expand uh, exponentially. So part of that then became uh, this larger dialectic, this larger conversation around what uh, revolution of common schools might look like. W.B. Du Bois talked about Booker T. Washington uh, without much love loss uh, therein, talking about a revolution in seven, uh, 1876. But, uh, but Booker T. Washington arose as essentially the leader of not one race, but two, a compromiser between both South and North and the Negro. Naturally, the Negroes resented this at first bitterly, uh, signs of compromise which surrendered their civil and political rights. As you see, Booker T. Washington uh, had the ear of a substantial amount of, of Black people uh, in the South and across the country. It was one of the most well-known uh, orators uh, of his time. He also had the ear of politicians uh, and philanthropists, which he marshaled to expand and consider two very important movements to the Black schools movement more broadly. One uh, was Tuskegee University in 1881. Uh, a school in which every bick that was laid, every plan that was drawn, uh, had the hands, bore the hands and the, the kind of blood, sweat and tears of black people. And the bricks, bricks were made uh, on this land, were crafted, uh, and the schools were crafted in that space. But after that, after that conversation around what uh, an education space at that level might look like, a collegiate level, uh, you saw a effort to consider black schools across the South. Uh, during a immense segregation, 53, nearly 5,300 schools were produced through the Washington Rosenwald Community Schools. Now I call it that in large part because uh, often it is given credit as the Rosenwald schools, but uh, fundamentally uh, most of the funds that were produced for each of these buildings came from communities. And I wanna make sure that we honor uh, that voice and that narrative uh, in this process. So in speaking about uh, both Tuskegee and the eventual necessity of a common school, uh, W.B. Du Bois talks about the missionaries in 68, the Association of Missionary, uh, Missionary Association, 
Um, he talks uh, thoroughly about uh, the need for uh, the missionaries to recognize the ineffectiveness uh, and the impracticality of establishing trade schools when uh, in earnest common schools needed to be produced prior to. Um, he notes that if not for the efforts of, uh, of, of the missionaries and others pivoting course and uh, bringing more than 35,000 teachers to, uh, to these schools, uh, schools like Tuskegee may not be uh, possible today. So again, above the sneers of critics and obvious defects uh, of this uh, procedure must ever stand its one crushing rejoinder in a single generation that they put 30,000 black teachers in the South. They wiped out the illiteracy of a majority of the black uh, population of the land and that made Tuskegee possible. So Tuskegee was a byproduct of these efforts uh, around common schools in the South uh, over time. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we saw through Booker T. Washington was, was a focus on creating the physical spaces that allowed for education to happen. One of the things that we saw on the other side of this argument, this contention, W.D. Boys uh, really focused on what were you learning when you were in those environments? How might we unpack the conditions of black people in space and how might that knowledge actually serve to establish a more thorough, robust consideration of our cultural commons uh, rather than simply uh, one that, that survives the uh, common school? Uh, and so through the combination of these two uh, considerations, uh, we saw the common schools move to grammar schools, grammar schools move to high schools, high schools move to some version of grad level or co collegiate level uh, education. Um, and through W. Du Bois, we saw the kind of frameworks for what it might mean for us to articulate a vision for black space an acknowledgement of black space and its thorough understanding of a social study of the Philadelphia Negro and through the thorough understanding of property uh, across and people's relationship to that property across Georgia. So I wanted to, to lay that framework because uh, mo much of uh, the Black Schools work speaks to uh, this cultural commons uh, being created, both in, in present, both in uh, digital and virtual formats and in, in uh, physical uh, presence. Much of our work does as well. So I want to pass it over to Joseph and Shani to talk a little bit more about their work. Um, I'm Shani Peters. I'm uh, sitting in a white room. Um, I'm wearing a olive green shirt. Um, my hair is out and big. Um, and we're coming to you from, very happy to be coming to you um, from what is now known as New Orleans, originally uh, Chittimicha land. Um, I'll let Joseph introduce himself. Um, I'm sitting next to Shani. I'm wearing a gray overshirt, brown hat. Um, I'm a black man. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. And we're going to get into introducing you all to our work. Um, really happy to be here today, um, to be able to speak about our work in this context. Um, to have that, that thorough history um, laid out at the mm -hmm. onset um, and to talk about our work in this continuum. Um, after we discuss our work, you'll hear um, Brian lay out his work, right? His individual work in this continuum. I'm gonna do the first one. Sure. So the Black School is an experimental art school. Um, where we combine art making and radical black history to um, prepare students to be radical agents of change in their community. Um, and we'll talk at length about how we do that. So the, the structure of how we do that is this three part ecosystem. The art school, uh, which we began with, the festival, after our first year of programming, we, we held our first festival. We've uh, hosted three now. Um, and finally, the design firm, um, which we launched in 2018. And we'll speak uh, at, at more length about each of these. So the school, which is the Black school, 
uh, consists of art workshops and public projects designed to teach critical thinking through art making and civic engagement. Um, we believe that this work must be socially relevant. So first we ask our students, what do you love about your community? And then we ask, what do you wanna change about your community? So that we know that our curriculum is based in our students' social reality. In one way, shape or form in each of our workshops, these questions um, are introduced and they allow the, the artwork that is made um, to take on the conceptual content of, of what's on the students' minds. So example of this is a workshop we did in bed in 2016. We did a screen printing workshop at um, Gotham Art Academy. And we, we brought all of the screen printing materials. Um, and we asked the students um, those two questions. What they love about the community? What they want to change about the community? And that led the conversation to to be um, dominantly about gentrification. So bed is on the edge of a lot of neighborhoods that have already gentrified, like Williamsburg, Bushwick, downtown Brooklyn. And it has a beautiful housing stock that's really attractive to folks with a lot of money. So these young people were seeing their friends, their neighbors, being pushed out of the neighborhood. Um, and they, they really wanted to speak to that. Um, so they, they created these prints on the spot. Um, and, and it's all about how black power is needed to curb this, um, this onslaught of displacement that they were seeing in this historically black neighborhood. So Black Love Fest is an art and music festival that we created to promote cultural movement and share students' artwork with the community. So we've done three of these today, uh, three Black Love Fests. Um, the first two were in New York City, the first one in Brooklyn at Brooklyn's Children's Museum, the second one in Harlem at Sugar Hill Children's Museum. And this is the last one we did uh, pre-pandemic. And it was at, um, it was in Houston at Emancipation Park. And we are invited down to Houston to bring Black Love Fest by Project Row Houses, um, which is, if you don't know about it, I definitely recommend you look it up. Um, it's one of the, um, the biggest inspirations for what we do. And it was a, a, a blessing to, to be able to collaborate. Then. Absolutely. So just quickly, you can kind of see the structure here um, displays the student work made over the course of the year. There's a stage we invite um, musicians to each festival, um, really adamant about um, expanding the notion of what art is, especially for black people, right? So we think um, in multi-genre, we think in fashion, we think in, in all aspects of black culture and all the innovation that we, that we bring. Music, um, dance. Mm -hmm. All the things. Um, and we invite other black artists to these festivals who are working in social engagement ways, who often create work and make it support of these institutions, but then the work doesn't actually come into contact with black people because of the history of art institutions. So that's another thing we, we really love about the festival. And we're looking forward to partnering with the New Orleans African American Museum for the next festival that we're able to host. Yeah, when COVID allows us to. So um, the most recent component um, of the Black School is the Black School Studio. It's a design firm where we train youth and paid apprenticeships to do real world client work. So this is our inaugural cohort. This is 2018 at the Bronx Museum, um, who graciously served as our uh, host and initial client, our first client, um, and hosted us for the first two years. Through the apprenticeship, we have now trained and employed uh, 16 design apprentices. We are looking forward to establishing our inaugural New Orleans cohort um, very soon. We're working on that right now. Um, and I don't know, should we talk more about um, the idea for, for creating it um, is really because 
we need our young people to come and engage with us on making this work that speaks back to our communities, to our needs, that helps us to solve our own problems. But we know as artists that make that work ourselves, that that work is not necessarily gonna get you paid. It's definitely not going to, you know, allow you to, to create a, a living for yourself, right? So we know we, that we need to be able to offer some tangible um, workforce training. Um, and we recognize graphic design to be a space that allows for the creative autonomy, some of the creative autonomy um, that hopefully you get to and enjoy as an artist, um, but also has a has a more sustainable economic structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sitting down in the front behind us is the young people, the, the other grown person <laughs> sitting next to us is Mitchell Johnson, yeah. Houston born, um, New York City based graphic designer and artist. And painter, yeah, mm -hmm. amazing, amazing human. So impact. Um, in the, the short time we've been in operation, about four or five years, we've worked with over 400 students, led 100 workshops, produced three Black Love Fests with over 3,000 attendees, trained and employed 16 design apprentices, partnered with over 50 organizations, and supported over 40 professional artists. Mm -hmm. So... With that foundation, we have transitioned from New York uh, to back up. Uh, I am from Michigan, from Lansing, Michigan. Um, Joseph is from here in New Orleans, from the West Bank. We met in New York. Um, we initiated programming there, moving from one space to another, partnering with anyone that wanted us to come that had space and students. Um, but as educators, you know, anyone that's taught a class for a week knows that the longer you have with students, the more impact you have. So our, our ultimate goal is truly to be rooted into a physical space where we can build those long term relationships and make sustainable impact in, in one community to have this walkable space. So that brings us to the Black Schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. um, so to echo some of the things Brian was talking about excuse me, in the first part of the talk. Um, we're um, indebted to and inspired by the, the many um, community-led Black school initiatives that have come before us, particularly the, um, the initiatives that center political education and activism in the curriculum. So this is Freedom School um, of SNCC, um, and it's an um, initiative that was started during the civil rights movement. Folks, Black folks in Mississippi had the right to vote in theory, but in practice, um, they're being denied and disenfranchised. Um, so a bunch of activists, um, educators, um, community-oriented oriented people descended on Mississippi in the summer of 1964 and set up these freedom schools. Um, they set them up in churches and houses and yards, wherever they could. And they taught the basics, uh, which was reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, but they also taught political education. They taught uh, black history and they taught folks the tactics they needed to um, to get the right to vote in, in, in action, not just in theory. Of course, following the civil rights movement, um, bridging straight from SNCC, um, Stokely Carmichael, um, first publicly stating the words Black Power, um, inspired the Black Panthers. And we take a huge amount of inspiration um, from this organization as well. Um, Black Panthers for, for self-defense, right, are widely known for um, for promoting the right to bear arms and for Black communities to protect ourselves. Um, but the social programs of the Black Panther Party is, is what endeared them to the community, is what made them, you know, this force that, that we, um, we know of today and that we all benefit from today, right? Um, so um, medical clinics, um, sickle cell anemia treatment, free breakfast programs, um, and the, the liberation schools. So this is an image of the Intercommunal Youth Institute in Oakland, 1971. And you can see the walls are populated 
by the work of Emory Douglas, who is one of our most um, inspirational influences, um, who is an amazing graphic designer um, and artist and who produced the, the Black Panther newspaper, which is um, in, in another way, an additional school, the public facing school um, that you know, more folks throughout the country were able to um, benefit from. So we take inspiration from these two um, sources widely for, for the Black school in general. And as we have been working towards establishing the schoolhouse, well, we've been um, really diving into the history of those Booker T. Washington and Rosenwald schools. They are titled the Rosenwald schools, but they're Booker T. Washington's idea. Um, I'll let Joseph speak about that. Uh -huh. So um, in collaboration with Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington um, was ever, was able to develop uh, nearly 5,000 black schools throughout the Jim Crow segregated South. And these schools were, um, they were created in collaboration with the communities that the school was served. So um, in most cases, half of the money was raised through philanthropy and the other half of the money came from the community and the labor and the work came from the community. And these schools weren't just uh, spaces for educating young people. They were spaces for educating the entire community. So they taught folks farming practices. Um, they were used for um, community events to bring the community together to discuss whatever things they need to discuss. Um, and as you can see, it's an early example of um, low cost architecture, um, open source architecture um, in like collective action that, that inspires us in our thinking of what the physical space of the black school would be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is my grandfather, Joseph Couillet Sr. Um, my grandfather in 1970, uh, this is my grandfather in 1971 at Lincoln High. Uh, which was formerly known as Rosenwald High. So it's part of that same initiative that, that we draw inspiration from. So um, he, he um, went off to World War II, came back, um, went to Xavier University, studied education, got his bachelor's and master's degree. Um, from Xavier here in New Orleans, which is a historically black college. Um, and around the time he was getting his education in education, the city of New Orleans didn't even hire black teachers. Um, but later on, he got a job at Lincoln High, formerly Rosenwald High, uh, became the principal, later on worked for the Board of Education and then after his passing, the school was renamed in his honor. So this is the legacy, the uh, familial legacy that we're working in. You know, um, our family is part of the built landscape um, of education in New Orleans. And with the Black Schoolhouse, we're just working to uh, continue that legacy, you know, take what we've been given and run with it. Mm -hmm. So this is an image of my father, um, Dr. Melvin T. Peters. He taught for 50 years across my home state of Michigan. He had his PhD in American literature before black studies programs existed. Um, and by the end of his career, he eventually retired from Eastern Michigan University um, in Michigan um, from their Africana and African-American studies department after 26 years. Um, so, you know, thinking about this legacy, this history of black schools, we're, we're really interested. Brian has given us this foundation beginning from 1830, right? And you see generation after next, one progression uh, of this motivation, of this need um, establishing itself and stretching out, right? So um, in Joseph's grandfather, uh, you see a tw twice graduate of a historically black college. Um, who raised children who all went to historically black colleges, something Joseph's father says. And grandchildren. And grandchildren, and right. To historically black right. colleges. I love what uh, Joseph Kuyet II um, encourages his kids and, and the students that he works with as a high school principal, but he encourages black students to go to uh, HBCU, at least for undergrad, right, as a bridge um, between their black home 
and this white supremacist nation, right, as a, as a space to, to start to feel things out because we know we're entering into hostile territory um, at these predominantly white institutions. And then my father, you see someone born in um, West Virginia um, in the 1940s, went to segregated schools, enjoyed his segregated schools. He um, tells a story of uh, one of his, one of the people that worked in the school. I, I'm pretty sure he says it wasn't even a teacher. He just, you know, did some other thing around the school, but was also engaged with the, with the young people. And he would say to, to my father, when you look in the mirror, um, know that you're looking at one of the best people that you're gonna see all day. Not no better, uh, but damn sure not no worse, right? This is the kind of love that you get when you have black educators, right? Um, but in the era that he's entering into undergrad and graduate school, um, black studies departments don't exist yet. So he has to make his own black studies uh, program um, through an American um, literature program. So he studies African-American literature. He studies black American literature because our literature is American literature too. Um, right, and with the, the collective movements that we see our people taking on with one generation to the next, um, he's eventually able to begin teaching in black studies programs. Um, another story that I love to tell is uh, that the, the director of the program that he was at for 26 years, Dr. Robert Perry um, actually initiated a black studies program before that at Bowling Green um, that was able to welcome James Baldwin at, as, as his, in his first faculty position, right? So two schools in like small Midwestern towns where there aren't huge black populations, right? Or, you know, proximately there, there may be um, black people close by, but you see these programs coming up. So all the ways that the black schools manifest themselves are, are part of this legacy that we're working through. So that brings us to our vision for the black school house. So based on our previous programmatic successes that we talked about, we want to build a schoolhouse that functions as a community center and not in my hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana, um, serving the community of the Seven Ward. Uh, these are very, very early drawings. These are me and Joseph's not architecturally trained drawings of the things that um, we, we want to see in this space. Um, we are very happy to be working with Brian um, and a team of other amazing architects, Juan Allen, also a New Orleans-based architect, born and bred New Orleanian, and La Eck, um, who have worked with new architectural forms um, for decades now. Um, this space will, um, is called a schoolhouse, but will function more as a community center um, so that we're not just educating young people and, you know, pushing away from, um, from their families as we see in our public schools presently, um, but all day um, the entire community of, of, of every generation can find some way to engage with this space from the garden to the gallery, um, which will also host events, um, which can also host anything from yoga to self-defense uh, martial arts, um, a library and meditation space on the ground floor, on the second floor, a media lab, um, for our uh, design firm um, and, and, and new media um, art making, uh, a wet classroom to really do all the things, um, a kitchen. Um, that's one thing that's definitely off in this early drawing that the kitchen needs to be bigger um, and also a residency space to, to host other BIPOC artists um, to come and, and teach with the community, you know, no expectation of what they'll do other than for sure engaging and sharing their practice. Um, with the, the local community. Finally, um, another thing that we kind of wanted to bring into the conversation, um, kind of brushing up our, our uh, reconstruction era history. Um, our, well, first, let's, let's talk about the, the, deck. the deck, okay. Absolutely. So um, this is the process deck that um, we, we des developed and designed and we saw that we were having issues with um, the conversations we were having with young people based off those questions. What do you love about your community and what do you want to change? They were fruitful. They were getting to the issues that young people were facing, but it, those conversations wasn't showing up in the artwork. Um, so we developed this card deck that um, really laid out our process in a methodical, you know, step-by-step -step way. Um, so there are six categories, principles, 
which are uh, loosely principles of radical black politics, questions which stimulate thinking on those principles, um, tactics which are creative activist tactics, um, the mediums which are like conventional art mediums, forms which are like the um, principles of composition and the elements of form um, in, in uh, themes, which you can think of as like um, curatorial themes. Mm -hmm. And the idea is young people in our workshops, artists, activists, they go through this process, pick one or two cards from each category. And at the end, they have the framework for what could be a creative activist project. You know, and it's our way of um, developing a learning tool to teach our process to a, a wider group of people, you know, bigger than we can reach in our workshops. But it also aids us in our workshops. Yeah, we use it in all of our workshops. We use it to brainstorm, to ideate um, new programming. Anything that we're doing, really, we're able to, to lean on this as a resource. Um, and it also keeps us kind of aligned with our, with our principles, right? With our mission, um, with the values and, and the things that we want to see achieved, right? So to that end, um, an example of one of these cards is a police abolition card, police abolition movement is a political movement, largely in the United States that advocates for replacing policing with other forms of social service, right? And so that's going back to the idea that I was very excited to share a moment ago, which is um, just the, the overlaps that we can see, the parallels that we can see between looking at the history of the school movements that come out of slavery abolition era, right? The, the liberation movement of this day was emancipation. Um, and, and we see black people taking the initiative, um, creating the, the alternative, right? So not just saying, Get a, do away with this with this negative, but demonstrating, creating the positive, right? Creating the world, the things that they needed and wanted for themselves in that time. Um, and seeing the parallel between that and the police abolition, defund the police movement of today. Um, also seeing the parallel for, between the political resistance, right? It's actually pretty phenomenal that the uh, reconstruction era lasted as long as it did considering the person that initiated it was assassinated, right? And then it was people in opposition to him carrying on, um, carrying on that program, right? The next president didn't support um, reconstruction. So it showed, and, and yet these schools still existed, right? And, and yet black people persisted and did what they needed to do for themselves um, and, and gave us this foundation that gives us public schools uh, across the country. Um, black people and the schools that were created out of the South um, were ahead of the desire for white Southerners to desire public schools for their children, right? Uh, the Black Panther Party created um, the breakfast program, which has led to the free lunch program that we now enjoy across the, the nation, right? So we set these precedents. Um, we have this 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 political power, um, and I and I as we show these examples of the ways that we're working and the way that Brian is working, I hope that broadly as a society we can also locate. Um, this, this push and persist in this push towards the defunding of and the abolition of the police state as we know it um, as well, right? And take inspiration from these historical precedents, take inspiration from black radical history to do the work we need to do today. As educators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Brian, we're gonna send it back over to you. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Joseph and Shani. Uh, let me get back up. So we'll talk a little bit to, to kind of wrap all of that together. You know, any of you who have heard me speak, uh, I often talk about the kind of definitions of what design justice is, and it calls on us to uh, envision uh, radical anti-racist spaces uh, of social, cultural uh, reparation to the process and outcomes of design. I talk about radical because it is working from the root of an issue up rather than top down. I talk about reparation because it requires us to repair and heal before we uh, move forward with anything. Um, I, I, I talk often about process and outcome because it requires us to do things in collective, uh, to acknowledge that power sits in the hands of a few privileged, um, that the values that we uh, instill into our physical environments are ones that uh, reflect our consideration for 
uh, broader society and that care must be instilled in all of this work. Um, the care for beloved community requires us to be in community. Um, and one of the things that's so often missing from our work as designers is a deep, uh, unabiding, uh, or an abiding uh, connection to the communities we serve, and specifically communities that have been marginalized from shaping space over time. So what might it look like to uh, think about the cultural commons, the cultural commons school as a continued and elevated form of public education? Uh, one of those processes uh, that I went over, or I went through over the last uh, 10 years, and I want to take a beat to reconcile and recognize that uh, none of this work that we do uh, at Colocate or myself uh, is done in isolation. It is all done with uh, collectives in mind. It is all done with so many other people whose hands have been, uh, who have touched these processes. But I speak uh, of this work uh, with a deep appreciation for all of that uh, support and effort. Uh, one of those projects is called Project Pipeline. Uh, we started uh, as an organization, the National Organization of Minority Architects started a program in 2005 called Project Pipeline. It was mostly an architecture camp that served to diversify the profession. In 2000, uh, 2012, uh, I took over this program uh, and changed the kind of core mission of this work uh, to identify social justice through the uh, through design education as the framework by which we uh, taught this program as a means to kind of ground a, a, a common understanding of our, our dignity and humanity through the perspectives of the physical environment. Um, this process has now served over, oh, I would say about 15,000 students uh, over the course, again, uh, in New Orleans and across the country uh, over the last uh, decade. Uh, it is one that asked young people to consider, uh, not to placate them, but to, to ask them to consider the, mo the most trying and considered um, uh, issues of the day. Um, uh, Joseph and Shani just mentioned dealing with pol police brut brutality or police abolition. Uh, one of the questions that our students had to deal with in this particular exercise, Headlines and Pathways, was one of uh, abolition, was one of uh, the, the kind of inherent violence in the policing of Blackness. We asked young people to consider how their cities are shaped and formed and how buildings respond to those forces that are applied to space. Um, what does the heart of the city look like when it is reflecting the heart of those who have been harmed and traumatized and marginalized over time? What does that implication start to look like when we bring it to the, the physical environment, when we share in the stories and narratives of people on the ground uh, this is a project called Lights Out, uh, in which we did a, a kind of cultural creative survey of lands using the language of uh, using the language of the second line to understand our city uh, in, in different ways. We honored them and honored the spaces uh, with poets and musicians uh, and artists who framed the context of buildings in place. Because if we don't ground set, if we don't understand these places, how can we ever build uh, with, uh, within them? We ask communities and young people to work with us to design posters and billboards uh, that sustain the voice of our neighbors and friends and family members. We talked about public education through the lens of definitions as we ran for mayor in 2018 talking about disaster capitalism, talking about uh, the Louisiana constitution that uh, prevented us from actually bringing properties back online uh, and encumbered so many other properties from, uh, from actually coming back into service. Uh, one of the projects that uh, started to have the same kind of public uh, execution of knowledge uh, was paper monuments. And we asked ourselves and uh, over 2,000 uh, additional people. Can you imagine new monuments for New Orleans? What does it look like when those conversations are made public, when the reciprocity between our will to, to have that conversation and the feedback of that conversation being made public is essential to the process? What does it look like when we uh, pull up stories and narratives that have been hidden under 
layers and layers of white supremacist uh, lionization of public figures. Um, what might happen when those things are embedded back into the physical environment? They are stumbled upon by uh, communities that often don't have access uh, to various bits of information. What happens when we reflect the truth in the voice, not a paraphrase, but the truthful voice of communities when they talk about culture and family and legacy and the women who shape this city? What happens when that gets reflected back into uh, the physical environment through, as we talked about earlier, uh, the production of, of newspapers that speak to the cultural presence uh, of, of uh, community members at scale? Can we reflect the, uh, the modes that people have expressed into some visual context? We often talk about, just to take a step back, we often talk about uh, anti-racist or liberatory practice as a combination of four specific things. It's one that we have to have a, an acknowledgement uh, of our obligation uh, to recognize the privilege and power structures that we hold within us and dismantle them. Uh, it is a creating and dismantling that constantly happens daily in our existence. But in order to do that, we have to uh, then sit with the narratives that shape space. We have to consider our work through the frameworks of mutual aid. What is the re reciprocal mutuality that we have with, um, with the building, with ourselves, with the communities uh, that we are involved with? Um, we have to think about how we de decolonize and, and dismantle uh, the frameworks that reproduce systems of oppression. And then we have to be able to future set. We have to be able to project what futures might look like if we reach the other side, if we ever get to justice, what happens then? What happens when it's a little light and playful uh, when we're talking about a gramophone on a former racist uh, met, uh, pedestal for a racist monument or when it's more somber and it's talking about the enslavement of uh, black people in this city? Paper Monument spoke to all of that and I think all of the work you've seen today speaks to the range of ways in which design can engage uh, at uh, individual and ephemeral scales to uh, collective and permanent scales across that landscape. But one thing that we all acknowledge and all kind of represent in this space is that community voice, especially in Black cultural spaces, uh, is radical by its very nature. And embedding that community voice in all of our spaces and all of our actions moving forward is uh, the only way forward uh, in a Black radical space in a Black radical, radical condition. Thank you very much. Well, hello and good evening, everyone. If you're on the East Coast of the US like I am, good evening. My name is Tara Luafemi and I'm seated with a yellow background. Uh, there's a white lamp, mirror, and digital clock behind me. I'm wearing a burnt orange long sleeve shirt with a collar. I talk with my hand, so you'll see a gold bracelet on my left wrist. Um, and I'm wearing gold earrings. I have white earphones in my ears. Uh, I'm a black woman and my hair is dark brown and pulled up into a rounded puff. I'm currently in Cambridge, Massachusetts and would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people. Shani, Joseph, and Brian, thank you so much for such an informative and exciting presentation and for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. It was really great. It's very educational for me. Um, I realized how ignorant, honestly, <laughs> I am of so much of this history. Uh, so my first question is really, uh, and, and you know, the audience, feel free to chime in in the Q&A section. I'll be looking at that and in the chat. But I, I really want to start off the conversation where we, we start to define a couple of terms. Often blackness is defined in terms of whiteness, if you understand what I'm, I'm saying, right? So this desire to create our own schools is in opposition to the Eurocentric histories that we've been taught. How do you define black in the context of the work of education and liberation? And how does your work help to center blackness and define it on its own terms? <laughs> Y'all want, want to take this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, we're starting off very, let's oh, get into yeah, it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm into it. Yeah. Y'all want or you want me to get this? Uh, you go for it. Okay. Um. <laughs> All right, so so just quickly, you know, I, I think um, there is a conflation of terms and terminology uh, across the spectrum of, of, uh, of, uh, of language 
in, in cultural context. So uh, when, I, when I think about blackness, uh, I want us to kind of pull back and understand blackness through the lens of race, through the lens of culture, through the lens of ethnicity, through the lens of nationality. Um, all of these frameworks for blackness are all, are all overlapping in certain folks at any given time. Right? And so you'll hear some folks say, well, I'm not black because I am not African-American. Uh, you'll hear some folks uh, only proclaim blackness as a relationship to, uh, a, again, a, a cultural uh, consideration. Um, and so I think I define the blackness that we speak of in terms of li liberation, uh, especially liberation through education, as a cultural consideration rather than simply a racial consideration. Um, kind of racialization of, of blackness is, is directly in response to, um, uh, to, to whiteness. But as I mentioned, uh, actually, I don't know, I've given three presentations a day, so maybe I didn't say this here, but, but culture is the consequence of persistent circumstance and immediate condition. It is fundamentally the patterns and patterns and uh, patterns, habits, routines that are shaped as a byproduct of the forces of the isms, whether that's ageism, whether that's uh, 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 gen uh, gender bias, whether that's sexism, and most, most ardently, whether that's racism. Right? Racism is a force that's applied to a body, a community, that then sh shapes a culture in response to it. And so I personally frame, and we personally, in, uh, with respect to our, our, our organization, frame blackness through the lens of culture not specifically through the lens of race. We understand that race is the force that we're always fighting against, um, but our outward projection is culture, our inward reflection is uh, on the kind of racial considerations of that force, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, all of that sounds right to me. Um, and for myself, I, I would just add um, an understanding of blackness as a choice, right? And I think that that was a bit of a shift as we started the trajectory of like, color to you know all these different things that black people have been called in this country Negro, right um, um the blackness as a choice um right and the i think as an artist like visually like this this well <laughs> this 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 mass right and the the capacity that that contains right through all these multitudes that ron has just laid out right and through all the cultural manifestations that we've created under this this titling um as black people um, and then I also say that with the black school, you know, we're two African American people. We very um, easily fall into that understanding. But I know Tara, we talked um, in one of the earlier calls about diaspora, right? Um, and and certainly for us, blackness is, is the African diaspora, and we recognize and honor that people coming from a different perspective, from a different local um, understanding might not immediately identify with that. We also understand that a lot of that very often has to do with global white supremacy, right? And, and uh, um, motivations to, to identify as something other than, right? Um, but for us, um, it's a point of pride. It holds so much and it's something that we welcome the entire uh, diaspora into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the shift. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Justin. My bad. Go. I just say I agree with everything Brian and Shawnee said about blackness. Uh, those definitions are like I'm all on board for those. But I also want to like make space for like spiritual kind of considerations of uh, blackness and black. I have a poem: um, "The universe thanks blackness for its eternal presence." You know, so I think we've been here. I, I think of my universe as black. I think about my gods as black. Um, so yeah, I think there's also that added, you know, um, well, well that, that isn't about whiteness, that isn't even about this physical body. You know, it's, it's like deeper, you know, it's about, it's about civilization. But it's also about before we even have rocks to fly through space on, you know. Stardust, yeah. So I'm I have a couple questions and then I, I I'm gonna open it up for you know other people to other questions. I'll I'll be filtering them in. But my next question then is do you ever anticipate a future where there's no longer a need for the black school, or do you want the black school to become the mainstream? Is the goal integration or do we always want to 
stand separate? Um, and I, I, I honestly don't know the answer. I'm, I'm like, you know, I don't know what I am thinking. So I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are. I'm interested to hear what Joseph says too. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna uh, start off with, I think the, the like the agreed perspective that, that Joseph and I are coming from um, and, you know, through working in different ways for some time and really being able to find ourselves, you know, as human beings, uh, we recognize that, um, that, that the lane of explaining to white people how racism is bad and you know, should, maybe shouldn't do that to folks, like, is not our lane. Is an important lane, is a necessary lane. This, this imagined reality um, in which genuine integration, right, not Black people folding into whiteness as integration is understood in, in America now and has been, but as imagined reality where true integration would even be possible would necessitate white people to really take responsibility um, for these histories and reform the present that still lends them all of the resources, right? Um, so we locate ourselves um, from the position of not wanting to have that conversation anymore, of being tired of that conversation, of very clearly getting the point of the no. <laughs> no, we are committed to white supremacy, right? Um, white people saying no. Yeah. Yeah. Our government, to be clear. right? Our government, our institutions, um, our institutions um, have, have consistently said, said no to that question. So yeah. we position ourselves as wanting to have a conversation with black people, right? With, uh, with ourselves and our allies and other people of color who recognize our shared oppression, right? And to figure out for ourselves within the spaces that we hold and with the, the abundant resources that we have, right? They may not be of the capitalist sort, but the abundant resources that we have, um, what can we do um, to create a better reality for ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a black nationalist. So <laughs> I believe in like the, the intention for me is a black nation. And that's not to say like in every, no, everyone isn't welcome. That's just to say, I believe my future vision for the future is a nation that centers black love and, and cares for black people. You know, I think, I think we deserve it. You know, <laughs> I think we, we've cared for this, you know? we've yeah. done enough for this nation. Yeah. So I think, we deserve a nation that cares for us, you know? So um, I don't really have faith in integration. I have faith in, in black folks. Like that's where, that's what propels me to do this work, my faith in black people, you know? Um, in our ability to save ourselves, you know? And we've seen that when we save ourselves, we save this nation. Listen. You know, but that isn't the intention. Everybody the intention thanks Stacey Abrams. To save ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I, I, I think we have been forced to be a nation unto ourselves. We've been forced to be a nation without, um, without land. The most prevailing trauma against Black people is the assault on land, the extraction of, of human bodies from land, and the maintained segregation of, of Black bodies from land, right? It's a, it's a continued and perpetual assault. Um, and that is ingrained in the theories of, of, of whiteness, right? And, and, and all of the systems that have pervaded from that. And so the question really isn't whether or not we want to see integration or assimilation. I think the question is whether or not whiteness itself wants to see itself implode <laughs> at some point. Does, does whiteness fully, truly want to see an implosion of its constructs and then ultimately arise something new? Uh, abolition, again, as we talked about earlier, abolition doesn't mean that uh, this thing is, is uh, you know, Thanos into to the ether. Uh, there is something else on the other side of it. Um, and I think on the other side of a system of whiteness m might be white people who have a different frame for who they are in this world, right? Uh, by other cultural mechanisms, by other, uh, other frameworks and uh, allows us all to live in a world in which that, that power dynamic is not solely determined by um, uh, the kind of unequal yoked uh, consideration of, of whiteness itself, so. 
Yeah, no, it's so hard to imagine a, a future that is not white supremacist. Like, and, and, you know, there is definitely such a fear of like what happens when white, like, you know, that's why white people are like, we're losing our power because now other people are speaking. It's like, yeah. if, if, if all you know of whiteness is, is bringing down others, I don't think that's like a real culture. Uh, yeah. But anyways. Yeah. But like, uh, imagine the fra- fragility you have to have in order to storm a capital and try to break down Nancy Pelosi's door. Like the fragility yeah. of that framework of the, the mindset of, of, of whiteness alone is, is one that has to be uh, reconsidered for all of us, for all of our sake. Yeah, the storm of capital because a white man, another white man was elected. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. It was still another white man and they were shaking. Like, you didn't want to like, it was elected. <laughs> But, yeah. but, but to bring it back to Tara's original point, it's so hard to imagine this future, but we must. We have yeah. to, yeah. yeah. We must, right? Yeah. We really, yeah. and in so many ways, we find ourselves, you know, kind of beaten down by 150 years old, 150 years of perseverance and still encountering these same problems, right? It's a very real exhaustion um, to acknowledge for sure. And I think this generation is is doing a very unique thing in balancing our wellness along with our commitment to resistance and social justice work, right? Because we are exhausted from it. And yet, if we cannot see outside of this, we will never be outside of this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, I I didn't, I realized I didn't quite close the point in bringing up police abolition and defunding the police, but it's like you defund the police to fund actual services, Mm -hmm. actual education, right? An actual civilization, right? We're talking about this fragility and people storming these capitals, but wanna call every other group of people in the world, you know, savages, right? An actual civilization that invests in people so that we can equitably enjoy society together, right? When 1% of people have, the other 99% will take what means they need to, to get what they need. But if Mm -hmm. there is balance, then you do not have this same need for this militaristic, violent, Right. We also kind of the Black Panthers are radical, but the U.S. government, our police, our military is the most violent. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Power structure you can you can imagine. So we can do away with that if we can actually imagine something else and funnel our resources towards that. Yeah. Yeah, As artists, as designers, as architects, we have a unique skill where we can take a step for, further than imagine. We can create the image for everybody else to see it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like we can create the images that represent that future we want. Um, we can make revolution irresistible, like mm-hmm. uh, Tony Kincaid. Yeah. yeah. So it, even in today, like during your presentations, we saw various forms of the, the architecture of Black liberation and the architecture of Black education. So we have students participating in the physical construction of the school at Tuskegee University. We have Mary Peak literally gathering people around a tree. And we even heard your, your plans for the Black school where you're talking about, you know, essential to the school is a kitchen, you know, and having like a wet classroom. So what have you found to be like the elements of an architecture that supports Black liberation? For me, it's um, the ways we already naturally learn. So again, the kitchen, you know, crowding around a meal, having an exchange, sharing knowledge with each other. So it's not like just this uh, hierarchical classroom where, you know, teacher at the front, students at the back, um, impart knowledge on these empty vessels, but everybody comes to the table with knowledge you know, a particular set of experiences that make them experts on their own kind of slice of the world and sharing amongst each other. Because, you know, if we do that, then we can recognize our abundance. Um, So the kitchen is important. The living room is important. You know, nature, you know, like Brian was talking about, sitting around a tree is important. You know, ways to rethink, you know, what's an inspiring classroom or inspiring learning space as opposed to a learning space that, you know, recreates these architectures of harm or architectures of control, 
you know, or architectures of capitalism. Right. So Shani and Joseph, you're both descendants of Black educators that really focused on Black liberation. Uh, and I, you know, it's great because this is going along with my question. Someone, um, Natalie Baden Duck, I hope I said your last name correctly, um, asks, in what ways do you think your design processes and creative processes differ from Eurocentric approaches that are often taught within North American design schools? And I'm going to tack onto that. What did your grandfather or your father, in what ways did they teach you that you have now added to your own pedagogy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our daughter's just coming back from a walk to the park with our neighbor, so. <laughs> no um, I mean, so. part of the question is like, how are you educating your daughter, right? You know, on these same things. Absolutely. And how's that influencing how you design a classroom? Absolutely, um, 100%. Um, so, you know, I, I spoke about, um, that, that story that my dad has told me from his experiences um, in black schools in West Virginia, right? The, the, the affirmation um, that he constantly received. Um, and when I first started teaching, I really recognized early on that I, I kind of had like a, a motherly instinct. And as a woman, you're, you're kind of taught to resist that feeling, right? That's kind of thought of as a pejorative. Um, a way, right, that this is narrowing you into the box of, of, of womanhood, but nurture, right, should be an aspect of, of, of education, period, right? And that's the thing that comes with, with centering Black love, right? So the core principles that we build all of our programming around are Black love, self-determination, and wellness. And certainly these are things that we experience in abundance in our households growing up, right? Um, and so, and we also recognize that so, so many of the black folks that you meet that are, you know, quote unquote, um, politicized, radicalized, that, that have access this history, either got it, this history of, of African history, right, of our, of our black history, um, either got it from a family member, or, you know, if they were so fortunate to find themselves in an undergraduate program in a black studies classroom somewhere. Right, and so there's this like 18 year old awakening, right? Um, so to get that um, knowledge instilled in me, truly as long as I can remember, um, I recognize as, as a true gift, right? I've never had a day in my life where I wanted to be anything other than black. Um, and so it's about sharing that and it's about with each generation, figuring out how to leverage the tools and the resources that become available to us to share that more broadly. That's a beginning to the answer, all the other folks fill it in. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak a little bit to how we think about it. Um, you know, in this work, uh, we have a, a core framework that, that talks about the principles and process of theory that speaks to honoring the griot. So how do we amplify the voices of extant communities and establish storytellers uh, of place as the knowledge bearers, right? Those folks who have, we often call those folks the Miss Marys on a block, the people who have a, a, a 50 year history of a place and know where the crack in 1968 happened and every child who walked over it over the course of, uh, of that time. Um, the griot is that person. And so whether young or old, the person who holds those stories of place uh, are extremely important to bring, not just superficially into a process, but to actively uh, amplify within the process. Um, recognizing that there is a building space it is one of the most uh, incredible ways to build community, building collective power uh, through the building of space, uh, actively redistributes the power that one has in the, the kind of consolidation of material and labor in one site and brings it back out to, uh, to communities uh, writ large. Uh, then we talk about form follows fiction. Often in communities that have historically been marginalized, uh, the stories that are told often supersede the physicality of those spaces. People might degrade or denounce uh, certain spaces because they don't necessarily hold the aesthetic value that uh, Eurocentric or Western uh, pedagogies tell us uh, that are valuable, right? So that's important. How do we lift those stories and make sure that uh, those narratives get placed back in whatever is reconciled for the site moving forward? And then the last two things we've already talked about, how do we imagine just futures in this work? We actually have to go through a process with the communities that we serve in acknowledging uh, those just futures and the potential of every process and every project to envision what those just futures might look like. Uh, and then I, th I think I said the last two, but, but land is liberation 
And again, design is protest. The protest is to have that unyielding faith in the power and potential of a just society. And if we use art and architecture and spaces to put justice and liberation at the forefront of our process by, to create architecture, uh, the better off we will be. Mm -hmm. Well, so I guess while we're winding down a little bit and we, I have one more question, but I see there's two more questions actually that I think I wanna get to um, in the chat, maybe three if we have time. Um, but the first one uh, is, is something that I was wondering myself. Uh, someone earlier had asked, while you mentioned familial ties to New Orleans, and you know, all of you have different ties in different cities and areas, can you talk about some of your strategies for connecting with the city, the community, the neighborhood, now as you establish the Black School Project there? Uh, and also, this kind of ties into a little bit of my work of, you know, when you take the Black, sorry, I think it's Black Love Fests, um, to, you know, different cities, how are you tapping into the communities there, almost like an outsider? Collaboration. Yeah, collaboration is key. Uh, Brian talked about um, this work being about uh, collective action and, and partnering with collectives. So that's at the heart of what we do. Um, we, it's, I, I wouldn't say we go to spaces that we aren't already you know, a part of it to some extent, you know, like I grew up in Houston, you know, so it made sense to do a Black Love Fest in Houston. Uh, we were living, I, I've lived in Brooklyn, so it made sense to do a, a Black Love Fest in Brooklyn. Uh, we were living in Harlem at the time, so it made sense. Um, yeah, I was born in, in New Orleans, so it made sense to come back here um, but that's not to say that's the end of the work because um, the tension of the black school is to serve a community. So um, from the jump from whether we're doing a one day workshop or we're building a space, we're asking people, what do you love about your community? What do you want to change about your community? And those conversations are going back into the work. And um, and Brian is an expert at doing this type of work, which is why we, we chose to partner with him. Um, collaborate. Collaborate collaborate with him on the Black School. Uh, and I'm sure he can talk more about how he does that type of work. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I, I think I spoke to it a little bit. We, you know, most of our work is, uh, again, pl pluralistic, uh, mutualistic in, in nature. We are actively seeking to, to cultivate uh, uh, community voice and community power um, to, to shape and form our work and inform the work. So I think in all of uh, our expectations in New Orleans, it's about being in community outside of the extractive uh, transactional consideration of, of a building, right? If the first time you're talking to people is when a space is going up, or if the first time you're talking to people is when you need something, uh, then you've already lost. Uh, and so when I talk about being in a beloved community, uh, it, it's necessary to, to, to truly own that and to be a part of community writ large. Uh, and then if you get a chance to use your skill set to in service of that community, that's all the better. But that's how, how I often uh, work. And so when we work in other cities, if we don't have those connections, uh, we often hire what we call community design advocates. Community design advocates are a series of folks who are connected to a particular issue uh, around a particular project and have a long history of advocacy organizing in a place and they help, uh, they, they become a part of the design team. And those folks actually serve as the, the, the kind of uh, arbiters of, of what conversations were happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. okay. It could be really harmful to a community uh, unintentionally if you drop in and then pull out quickly. So like, yeah. like uh, Brian talked about that, that long-term connection, you know, being in community whether it's for a project or, you know, just because like you, you, uh, you want to connect with the people and you're of the people, you know, that's one thing that's important to us as educators, as artists is 
um, to get away from a Eurocentric teaching of community engaged art and design. You know, a lot of times in these grad programs, they teach it from a perspective of a white person going into a community of need and serving them through art and design. Whereas- Which replicates the white life savior complex that we're dealing with through all spaces of society, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it really reflects back on the need to redistribute resources, redistribute education, redistribute mm -hmm. Uh, you know, professionalization in community art has been a thing forever, right? People have been doing the work as social practice They're artists already and designers, doing the work. yeah, for generations. Um, but then, you know, uh, a privileged kid from any ethnic background, you know, comes through with a, a degree um, from some prestigious program, and now they're more qualified for um, grant money to support their programming than the people that have been doing it for 40 years, you know? So it always comes back to that. It truly does. Mm -hmm. So my last question, and it's actually kind of funny because this goes back to the question I asked in the earlier meetings we had, I mean, it's a little bit about diaspora. So Oluf, Olufemi Olami Jula, sorry, <laughs> yeah, the same name as me, and for some reason I wanted to say my own name pretty much, um, asks, how can Black immigrants ide identify within the Black radical space? Many immigrants are experiencing racial segregation for the first time and aren't familiar with the culture of African-Americans. Is there a way to bridge the culture gap? And we had talked earlier, you know, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm a young Nigerian immigrant and, you know, diaspora is, is very important, right? Like my uncle was the one that taught me a lot of my own Nigerian history. And then when I went to college, I almost got re-radicalized when I took a Yoruba art class with a Yoruba professor. Um, and, you know, it almost felt like my uncle was teaching me because he became almost like an uncle to me. And there's that kind of almost like familial teaching, but you guys are having these programs in pretty diverse areas. So, you know, I'm always thinking about Haitians and how they're very proud of how they were, you know, able to free themselves very, very early. They're a great example for being black and radical very, very early on. Um, so I, this this question kind of gets to something that I, I'm always thinking about that, you know, that even though we do have these ideas about African-American versus African versus Caribbean, there are these histories that we are still able to come together and learn from to develop new ideas of black radical spaces. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about how you've had some of these experiences in the very diverse neighborhoods you've been doing your work in. Yeah, New York is as diverse as it gets, um, for sure. And the thing that, um, a thing that I always think about um, with our work and, and, and working with Black POC and allies, right? For the record, we majority have Black students in our classrooms. Um, but if anyone, if you're working with a, a public school and you go into their classroom, there's a very rare situation where you can say, pull out only the Black students, right? So <laughs> if you're working with that classroom, I take, uh, I take heart in, in knowing that to hear Black history from Black people is very important, right? So often we, we get just a snippet of, of facts thrown at us in February. Um, they come from, uh, you know, these like portrait packs that get stamped up on the walls and there's no context, right? Um, so to, to be able to be the expert, right, for teaching our own history is very important. And if I find myself in Haiti, if I find myself in Jamaica, if I find myself in the Congo, I want to be learning from a Congolese person. You know what I mean? If I find myself in that space, that's where I'm going to go to find out what my relationship is with my diasporan people, right, in that space. Um, and, it, and it is really, it is that, you know, we have a particular um, set of experiences here in this American context, but anywhere around the world, there's gonna be a different set of expertise on what blackness is and, and how it um, is lived in that place. Yeah, and I think I, I mentioned black nationalism and there's no way to talk about black nationalism in like an educational context. If you're not talking about the continent, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if you're not talking about Haiti. Um, so we, we bring those different histories into the classroom. Yeah, absolutely, right. So, um, we, we make space for, like I said, exchange, a learning environment, you know, so it's not just one person talking from their perspective, but it's a lot of perspectives. Exactly. 
Um, but I think like, before we even get to that, I think we all collectively have to decolonize our thinking. You know, a lot of black, black Americans, black North Americans, you know, see people from Africa through a white supremacist lens and vice versa. A lot of folks from the continent see black Americans from a white supremacist lens, you know, and it's not intentional. Like that's the media, that's the narrative we're told about each other. Yeah. So it, it takes some work that we have to do eternally to like break down those, 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 that propaganda we've all been like fed to, to really have exchanges between our community, you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know we're running on time, so I'm not gonna answer this one. Uh, although I have a lot to yap about, just find me on Twitter if we need to do that. But uh, I know we need to, to kind of close yeah. out. I feel like you could say, I, let, let's give Brian, let's give you like a two minute, <laughs> okay. let's see if you could do a two minute spiel and then we'll um, wrap up. Okay, uh, yeah. okay, a couple notes. One is uh, when we talk about W.B. Du Bois and uh, Black Reconstruction, he talks about uh, Haitian Revolution uh, and the kind of designation between that revolution and land, land mass versus, uh, so in their ability to be successful versus uh, in the Southern states, the revolutions having a harder time being successful because uh, kind of white laborers who wanted to see themselves as planters themselves uh, massed over 5 million and could put down revolutions in a different fashion. And I say that to say that there are different experiences even in the context of global white supremacy that have to be acknowledged wherever we are, wherever we go. And so the ways that, that I see uh, black immigrants uh, into this particular country um, is to, to, to do what we all do, which is uh, within the, the framework of a, of a kind of a liberation society is to think about, um, to, to honor those experiences to sit and hold our, our, our own judgments and biases to account uh, in relationship to those experiences, and then to fundamentally uh, exist within those, those communities that we mentioned earlier, right? Like, can we be in a beloved community to, to learn more, to know more, to experience more uh, in, in that relationship? So uh, I think there's so much to the, again, the, the global Black experience, but relative to the states, uh, you know, we have to acknowledge that uh, the diaspora has so many manifestations and exists in so many different ways uh, and to appreciate and love uh, all of those manifestations uh, because they are all resistance. They are all love. They are all uh, liberation for us. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you. It became uh, end of a session, end of this amazing panel. It's absolutely brilliant, invigorating. And I have to confess, yesterday I was on a panel called Radical Architecture of Future. And one question that came up was what does future look like? And I see the future as a result of this panel. I think you are the future. Because as you say, black school, black, it's a culture and culture-based pedagogy is what is going to take a root. And it's going to be a part of important part of civilization despite have just started. And then it will engage, enlighten, and educate all of us as you have educated all of us through this entire hour, an hour and a half session. And I have to say our school needs education because it's based upon systemic racism, white supremacist, and we even have a lot to learn going along with you. And then I really appreciate all your amazing insights and I think it's energetic. We get a lot of chat and sorry, we did not have to able to answer all the questions and I hope this is going to be an ongoing conversation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Shani and Joseph. And Tara, thank you for your brilliant moderation of the whole session and wrapping up. So congratulations, everybody. And thank you so much and good night. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.